I grew up at a kind of a classic Lever to Beaver home. Um, Christian home, teacher parents, just kind of did the normal life. Um, my high school sweetheart and wife grew up in a different environment and she was born into an abusive home and adopted into an abusive home. Um, back then, we romanticized about how cool it would be to adopt and kind of give back and kind of do what was right. Um, so fast forward a few years, we uh, ended up getting married during college and kind of progressed through. Uh, we had a daughter shortly out of college and as she turned eight, my wife and I had off and on had the conversations about, is it time to adopt? What do we need to do? And it felt right. It just felt like that was the right time to do it. We also knew that we wanted to adopt through foster care. Ultimately, um, although we were really looking for one child, uh, we found a family of three kids. Uh, these three kids had had a pretty rough life. Um, they had been through nine different homes before we adopted them. And we also saw challenges from the outside. Um, our family members, some family members, would treat the kids differently. They would do things for our natural born daughter that they wouldn't do for our other kids. Um, to us as a family, I don't see a difference. Um, when, I, when I told my oldest that we were gonna do this video, she said, why do, they, why do they wanna know our story? And I was, because we adopted the kids. She literally forgot. She, oh yeah, yeah, okay. Um, that's, that's the level we function at. We've seen lots of challenges and the kids have, have, have helped us through lots of things. Our lives have also changed immensely. Um, having the kids and everything is new, everything is exciting and that their level of growth is so amazing and it builds our lives and it makes things much stronger and it makes everything that much more enjoyable. Um, for them, they carry, they came with a lot of challenges. Um, having seen so many homes, having been told this is your forever home so many times, it's hard for them to build those relationships. Through the years, uh, they've learned to. And for us, that's a huge sense of pride to know that our kids have worked through that and they can understand. The oldest child that we adopted, um, had a lot of things done to her and was very, very difficult. Um, after years of therapy and working with her, um, ultimately, well, we spent two years of the courts and the doctors telling us that she needs to find another placement, that she's a, she's a danger to the home a hard decision was needed at the time to get her the help she needed and to keep the boys and everyone else okay. So we ended up terminating rights on, on our daughter so that she could get the help that she needed. It was an incredibly difficult decision and still something that um, we carry and struggle with today. Our relationship with God has been hit and miss at times. Uh, like I said, I kind of grew up in a very Christian household and going through all this, um, as my faith has definitely been challenged and questioned and why am I getting pushed so hard and I can't handle the feeling that I just can't handle what we're getting pushed through. Um, my wife didn't grow up in a Christian home and so she, if you asked her what she was she would call herself a Catholic um, but she wasn't really deep into religion itself. So before we adopted the kids, we had gotten involved in church and, and her faith was had, had built. Um, as we went through the, the foster process and, and been all through the challenges, um, it really challenged her faith. And in many ways, she kind of lost her faith. So we always tried to keep the kids in church and we would, we were seeing ease for a while and we'd show up at Christmas and Easter for a while. We had a couple years where we were pretty good about going but it was always a challenge. And then for a while I would take the kids, but they'd see this kind of split. Um, and it was just because we had been pushed so hard and life was a challenge in many ways for us. Um, for my faith, it was there, but it was, it, it, it was always a challenge to wonder how hard can I go? How hard am I pushed? Um, in the recent years, things we learned to 
live our life the way we felt it was right and the way we felt God was calling us. So we, we, we ditched a lot of things. We stopped trying to keep up with the Joneses and we said, God, what do you want us to do? And that's the direction that we went. As we continued down that path, um, life became easier. So faith was going well, life was going well, and, and everything is humming along like it's supposed to. Um, my wife wanted to, she's a teacher, so she ended the school year, and she wanted to go to Pennsylvania on a trip. Um, she took the kids out, and I had to stay back and work, and she brought the boys out. They had a fantastic week in Pennsylvania. Um, the end of the week was going to be a half marathon that she always did. Um, she ran her half marathon, did a, did a fantastic job. The downside of that is she passed away. So, obviously, tough challenge. Um, I'm now a single parent of three kids, and our kids lost another parent. It's something that challenged us, but also made our faith stronger. Um, we know that God will push us and God will challenge us, but he won't give us more than we can handle. And so, as we went through this, um, one of the benefits of going through the fostering process and adopting kids is you build a network and you build people around you that you can trust and you can and they believe in you. And so when my wife passed, I had no idea how big that network was. And that outpouring of support and that outpouring for our kids was amazing. Um, that proved to us that God was there. That although it was time for, for my wife and their mom to go, he was there to watch over us. He was there. He was there to keep us strong. So since that time, that was June. Um, since that time, we tried to rebuild. And we're doing pretty good. Kids are back in school, successful at that. They're doing their activities. From our day-to-day -day life, life appears normal. Um, it's been a test, it's been a push, um, but I think my whole family would agree, all the kids, that uh, although we miss my wife and their mom, um, our faith is growing stronger and we believe that God is watching out for us. And all of the challenges and all of the difficulties that we have seen through life have prepared us to be able to handle this. That to me is a sign that although I don't like the, the way it panned out, I have to know that God had a plan for it. And we just have faith in his vision and that that's the way our life is meant to be. You want to stand up, Rob? Is that okay? This is Rob Fader. Give him a hand. <clears throat> I don't know if you caught that. Uh, Rob, that's, that's pretty recent. It happened this last June. What was the, uh, isn't that correct? June 2nd. And so they are, been coming to North Road. And uh, if you don't know Rob, man, I just encourage you to get to know him and his boys and uh, just love on him. Put your hand around his neck. Get to, get to know him as the person. He's a great guy, loves to run. I almost run over him every day on my way to work on Sunday mornings. <laughs> I just swerve at him a little. It's okay. Um, but man, I, I seriously, get to know Rob. I want to pray for you, Rob. Can we do that before we go any further? Let's just pray and let's lift Rob up. Dear Jesus, thank you for the opportunity to know Rob. Thank you for the chance to have him in my life. 
And I pray, God, that you would help me to be Rob's friend, that you would help me to help be your word to him, that, God, as a church, we would wrap around him and his boys, and we would hug them, and we'd love them, and we would carry them through an incredibly hard time. God, I pray that there's others that heard Rob's story today that are hurting so bad, that are going through the emotional war of a lifetime. I I just pray, God, that you would help them to hear that and to hear the one amazing words of strength that that, that Rob said, and that is that I don't understand it, but I know God's in control, and I still follow him. And help them through this message today to follow you the way Rob is trying so hard to follow you, God. And I ask these things in your name. Amen. Thanks, buddy. All right, so how do we do this? How do we walk through something like what Rob walked through? How do we walk through job loss? How do we walk through divorce? How do we walk through the greatest trials of our life to where we feel like nobody could understand it, nobody could fathom it? Man, nobody understands the, the pain and the anguish I'm going through. And, and how do you deal with that? For some of us, like I said, we will deal with it all different fashions and all different formulas. We'll have people who eat. We'll have people that recluse. We'll have people that do all sorts of different things. And what I want to show you today is what you direly need to do. There, there is, you, you sit, if you're sitting here in that position, maybe not as, as serious as Rob's, but maybe, maybe just as serious. If you're sitting there, you sit at a crux that you have no idea that you sit in. Because sometimes we get to Rob's situation, we go, I don't know how my life could get worse. And I'm just here to tell you, if you don't take the steps I'm going to give you today, it could get worse. And, and what God wants you to know is in him alone, there is hope. So if you got your Bible, do me a favor, go to Matthew. We're going to be in chapter 7. We're going to be in verse 24. And he says a very simple statement. And I think it totally plays in to what we're dealing with when it comes to emotional baggage, tragedies that can happen in our life and how we deal with them. Let me read it to you. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. Jesus is speaking and he's talking um, in the Sermon on the Mount. And here's what he says. Everyone then who hears the words that I speak and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on what? On rock. Let me say that again. Everybody who hears the words that I speak and puts them into practice will be likened to a wise man who builds his house on the rock. Let's just be honest. When you're going through an emotional emotional turmoil, I don't know about you, but there's times I don't want to hear what anyone has to say. I don't want you trying fixing it because you can't fix it. I don't want you to come in and comfort me because I don't want to be comforted. I don't want to talk about it anymore. I don't want to deal with it anymore. Some of you guys have felt these emotions. And, And beyond that, here's another thing that happens. I don't care what God has to say because people told me all along that God would never give me anything more than I could handle. And I'm just telling you right now, I can't handle this. Rob, I heard you make that statement that, you know, God won't give us anything more than we can handle. Rob, I think that you're 90% right. Let me tell you one 10% portion that I, that I want to challenge you to think on and other people to think on. And this is the crux of what we're going to talk about today. It's not that God won't give you anything you can't handle. It's that God won't give you anything you can't handle with him in your corner. Sometimes we go, God won't give me anything I can't handle. Well, I can't handle this because you're trying to handle it all by yourself. Because you don't want to hear anything that God has to say. Because you won't plant your feet on the rock. You would rather plant your feet in your, in, in, in Waller, understandably so, in, in what has gone on. You are fixated on the problem instead of fixated on the solution. And what Christ is saying in Matthew chapter 7 is very simple. He goes, if you will take my words and you will put them into practice, I promise you it will be okay. I, So many times when emotional baggage happens, we grab it by the handles and we don't see anything but it. You ever heard the statement, I can't see the forest because of the big tree? Man, there's this huge tree in front of you and you can't see the forest of truth that's behind it because all you see in your perspective is the tree. When emotional baggage comes in our life, we stare at the tree over and over and over and over. We analyze the tree. We question the tree. We wonder why is the tree in my front yard? right? But what we don't realize is behind the tree is an incredible plan that God has for your life. 
When I take God's word and I listen to it and I apply it to my heart, here's what I can do. I can go to Jeremiah 29, 11, and I can go, I might have lost this or I might have had this happen to me, but I know the plans that God has for me, according to Jeremiah 29, 11. He gives me plans that are good and not for evil. They're to give me a future and a hope. That means beyond this tragedy that I've experienced, there is another whole journey that God has for me, and it's going to be okay. Is it going to be the same? No. Can I survive if I lean into God? Yeah. But so many times what happens, we want to get a million miles away from anybody, anything, because you know what? God did this to me, and I'm tired of it. What would happen if in the middle of your greatest angst, you just went to God's word? I remember I was going through a horribly hard time a few years back, and I was wondering as we were getting ready to plant this place, how I was going to pay the bills for my family, just being honest with you. And I was sitting there and I was going, what am I going to do? And so I sat there and I just opened my Bible up to Matthew. And here's what it said to me. As great as God takes care of the lilies of the field and the birds of the air, how much, Matt, will he more take care of you? He hasn't forgotten you, Matt. And I leaned into that verse. And every day I would open my Bible and God would give me another one. Cast all your cares upon me because I care for you, Matt. Matt, you were fearfully and wonderfully made. I have a plan for your life, Matt. I haven't forgot about you, Matt. Matt, I love you. You are my child. And as I would take these verses and I would put them into my heart and I would live by them, I would all of a sudden feel a firmer foundation underneath my feet. You see, Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He doesn't want you to put your face in this because this will put you on firm foundation. What he wants to do is he wants you to fixate on the emotional baggage that you have. Man, I can't believe that happened to you. I, that happens to nobody. Man, God must hate you. Why would God allow that to happen in your life? I mean, good grief. Why does God, just, does he have it out for you? Isn't it funny? Whenever we have bad things happen in our life, we never blame the devil. We always blame God. God, why would you do this to me? Why don't we ever just look at the devil and go, dang it, I'm so tired of you doing that to me. But no, what do we do? We blame God. Let me ask you a question. Most of you have, you're over the, I see a lot of faces over the age of 30. You all have your own place, hopefully, by now. And when, when you get to 30 years old and you get hurt at your house, cutting the grass or doing the dishes, you cut your hand on a glass, do you scream real loud? Darn it, Dad, Mom! Why'd you make me cut my hand? Why'd you allow that to happen? Well, no, because you know your parents live in a different town and they had nothing to do with it, right? God doesn't always have to do with the calamity that happens in your life, but we are so quick to blame God instead of to lean into God. What if we did that? What if I started taking the truth that God gave me about marriage, that he chose somebody specific for me, and if I'm in the middle of a divorce, that his hope for me is not over? What if I start reading about the freedoms that come from getting away from addictions and I started obeying it to the point where I listened and I did it? I'm building myself on rock when I do that. But a lot of us, let's be honest, what happens? We get angry. We get frustrated. We blame God and we put up the Heisman Trophy stiff arm and we go, God, I want nothing to do with you. I, you got me in this mess. Why would I want to trust you anymore? And we put our arm up and we push God away. And here's what God says in Matthew chapter 7 about pushing him away. I just want to read this to you real fast. Matthew chapter 27, verse 26. Everyone who hears my words and does not do them. In other words, you ever been here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what the Bible has to say about my issue. I don't want to hear it. I've tried that road and we get tired of that road and we don't walk that road long enough and then we walk off that road and calamity comes and we blame God and we go, I've tried it, I don't want that anymore. Everyone who hears these words of mine and, puts, and does not put them into practice, he compares them to sand. He says, I'm gonna read it to you. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on sand. I grew up, uh, I grew up, I spent three years before I came here in Orlando, Florida, and we had this issue all around. You never knew when the next house was going to be eaten by a sinkhole. You guys know what a sinkhole is? I'll tell you what a sinkhole is if you don't know it. But literally, we had one happen across the street from my mom and dad's house. The house across the street, the yard just boom. All of a sudden, you came out one day and there was a massive hole in their yard. People's houses completely got eaten by, by sinkholes. There was a dude, I'm not making this up, it came on the news one morning. His house looked perfect from the outside, 
but the entire bedroom, living room, kitchen, everything, boom, gone by a sinkhole. That if you open the front door, there's a hundred foot hole in his house where he got swallowed by and he died. I mean, it's bad stuff. I want to show you a picture of one. That's what they look like. Is that not crazy? Anybody want to move to Florida? What they do with these things, all they can do with these things, is they go in and when, that, when it's happened, it takes millions of pounds of concrete and they completely fill that thing back up with concrete until it's full to the rim and then they flatten it off and they put the road or the house or whatever back on top of it, right? Here's why it happens. When you go to Florida and you live there for any amount of time, you realize that there is no such thing as dirt in Florida. It's just sandy dirt. And after two or three days, my wife's laughing right now, you would sweep the floor spotlessly clean and you come in three days later and your front living room feels like a beach because there is just sand everywhere. And it doesn't matter if you live on the coast or you live right in the middle of Florida, everything's sand, okay? Underneath the sand in certain pockets are these rivers, okay, that are underground and nobody knows it for sure and exactly where they are. And there's a thin layer of limestone over the top of the river and then there's nothing but sand, sandy dirt, okay? These rivers rise up. And when they rise up, they start messing with sand. You ever put water in sand and how it just kind of dis disintegrates? And all of a sudden, if that river gets too high in one section, boom, it's gone. Can you imagine? I've always thought about this. Can you imagine falling in that hole? I got to think rivers move, right? So can you imagine falling 100 feet down into a hole only to land in a river that's going to take you underground so far down? Oh, that's horribly terrifying. I hate that thought, right? Ah! Now... With that in mind, let me throw this to you, okay? When I don't listen to what God has for me, I'm doing that. I'm setting myself up. I'm saying, hey, I can do this on my own. And we say to ourselves, we go, man, it could never get worse than this. Yes, it can. And some of you, you're experiencing the fact that it can get worse until you lean in to God. Man, if I've learned one thing, when I go through trials and when I go through tribulations, when God's trying to teach me something hard or when I'm going through a painful moment, here's what I've learned. I just close my eyes and I take God's word and I remember what it says and I lean into God as hard as I can. Let me tell you why. Because there's gonna be a day when that trial's over. It's just a season. I, Rob, you're in the worst season that I can ever imagine somebody having to go through, but there will be a day when you come out on the other side of the season, Right? For this moment, close your eyes and lean into God and trust his truth as much as you possibly can. Here's why. Because when the season's over, you'll know how to follow God in a way that probably most people in this room never, ever will because they never went through what you have walked through. Some of you are hurting so bad. Lean into God. Some of you have no idea how you're gonna pay next month's bills. Lean into God. Start claiming his verses. Some of you have no idea how you're gonna live with the person who just abuses you day after day. Claim onto God's word. Some of you have no idea because your husband or your wife are gone. Claim into God. Lean into his word. Trust him. Just whatever it says. There's gonna be days you get up and you're gonna wanna do it, right? Man, I don't wanna do that. Every time you don't lean on what God's word says, you are putting yourself at risk to just fall deeper and deeper and deeper down the hole. So if this is you, I wanna give you some things. I, I wrote them down and then we're gonna be done. Just four quick things. I'm not gonna talk about them, I'm just gonna read them to you. Remember when I was a little kid and the pastor would go, four more things. I'll, oh, no! If you're in this hurt moment, right? Realize that this is a season. I said that just a second ago. Realize this is a season. This is a tree in the midst of your forest. There will be a day when you will walk past the tree. I promise you. And while you're walking past that tree, man, I just encourage you, lean into God with everything you got. Know that your truest adversary is not God, it's Satan. Satan's your enemy. God's your friend. Don't push God away in the middle of these wars that you're fighting. Lean into him. Quit looking at him as the enemy. He's not the enemy. Decide right now that you're going to trust God's ways more than any other way. Some of y'all, you're going, I don't want to be around people, so I'm not going to get involved in a small group. Man, you need to dive into a small group. You need somebody that will put their hand around your neck and go, it's going to be okay. God says in his word, don't forsake the fellowship of believers. There's a reason why he says that. Because when you're hurting, you need them around you. 
And some of you are going to go. I just guarantee you're going to go, I don't want people around me. I don't, I don't want to deal with them. I don't need another person asking me. Yes, you do. You do. And finally, last one. Choose today, right now, to just let go of the baggage. Some of you, you're gripping. Man, I'm, I don't know. I don't know, man. I just fixate on this all the time. When you get ready to fixate on your baggage, pick up your Bible and just Google what you're dealing with and say, I need a verse on divorce. And man, a bunch of verses will come up in the way God blesses and takes care of a person that's been through a divorce. God loves you. He's not your enemy. He hasn't forgotten you. But you have to put down your baggage to see it. Will you do me a favor? Will you bow your head and close your eyes? Band's gonna come up. If you're sitting in here today and you're going, Matt, man, that is me. I I need to put baggage down and I I just need to trust God. I don't wanna do anything that's gonna make you feel any more out of touch than you are right now, right? I just wanna pray for you. If that's you, just lift your hand. Matt, that is my life. Just lift it up. Okay, awesome. Thanks for your honesty. We are the most transparent church around here. You don't have to feel weird about raising your hand. Just know that you're going to be lifted up and prayed for. Let me ask you this question. If you're sitting in here or maybe in the East Room and you've gone, I've wanted to be a million miles away from God because of what he's done to me. And I need to just kind of let that go. And I don't know how. Just lift your hand. I just want to pray for you. All right. Jesus, I pray for those that lifted their hand. God, show them that you're their father. Help them to trust you. Help them to put their trust in your word. That God, in these darkest moments, when they're walking and it feels like they don't know the next step to take, God, I pray that you would just illuminate one, illuminate the next step that they have to take, God, so that they know that you're there. Help them to just embrace and lean into who you are. Help them to trust that your love is good and that it endures no matter what we're going through. And Father, I know some of the things that are going on in this room, God, and they're hard. Father, help them not to hold on to them. Help them to hold on to you. God, one thing that's amazing about you is I can't hold on to you and hold on to baggage at the same time. So God, I just pray for those that need to cling to you, that they would cling with everything they got, and naturally that baggage would slip away. And God, I ask these things in your name. Amen. Let's stand. Let's sing.